My new book, The China Choice, is about the choices that America faces in how to deal with China as China's power grows. I think these are amongst the most demanding, difficult choices that America's ever faced. Uh, and I think they're amongst the most important, both for America and for the rest of the region. Of course, America doesn't have choices to make by itself. China also has very important choices, really symmetrical choices to make with the choices that America faces. But I focused in the book on America's choices because I think there's been a tendency, both in the US and more broadly, to focus more on China's choices, to look at the choices that China has to make about how to adapt to America. I think we also need to look very carefully at that other set of choices, the choices that America has to make about China, and that's really what the book is all about. My message on those choices is pretty stark. I think there are really only three fundamental options for the United States. It either withdraws from Asia as China's power grows, or it contests China's challenge to American primacy in the Western Pacific, or it finds a way to share power with China in Asia. I think withdrawal obviously would be a very bad outcome for Asia, and I think also a bad outcome for the United States. I think sharing power with China is an inherently very difficult thing to do. But uh, competing with China, entering into a strategic rivalry with China for primacy in the Western Pacific, does seem to me to be both very costly for the United States and very risky with a high chance of leading to a really catastrophic conflict. So I therefore conclude that for all its difficulty, sharing power with China is the choice America should make. I think although sharing power with China would obviously be very difficult for the United States and carry significant risks, I think the risks and costs of rivalry with China are much higher. I think they carry a real uh, danger of a catastrophic conflict and for that reason I argue that the United States should be willing to share power with China. That of course presupposes that the American polit political class has to rethink its approach to China very fundamentally. I think at the moment uh, the trajectory of US relations with China is very much towards competition. I think that was made very clear by Barack Obama's uh, major speech in Canberra in November last year. And I think if the US is going to avoid escalating rivalry with China and move towards a relationship of power sharing in Asia, it's going to have to rethink its approach to China very fundamentally. Now, a lot of Americans will find that surprising and a lot of America's friends and allies in Asia will find that surprising. I think a lot of people think that the day-to-day -day management of the relationship is quite good and that although there are some tensions over particular issues, the fundamentals of the relationship are heading in the right direction. I don't think that's right. I argue in the book that the fundamentals of the relationship are, are quite weak because the US and China have fundamentally divergent contradictory views of where that relationship should be heading and their um, core roles in it. I think the United States does seek to preserve a position of primacy in Asia which it's exercised for many decades and I think China seeks to expand its role and influence in Asia as its power grows to an extent which is incompatible with America maintaining primacy. The reason why I think it's so important for the US to be willing to do that, to be willing, if China is willing, to step back from preserving primacy and share power, is that I think the consequences of uh, rivalry would be so great. It's a very important part of my analysis that uh, as China pushes for more power and influence, as the United States pushes back and tries, as I think it is really trying to contain a Chinese challenge to America's primacy. China pushes back in turn, the rivalry escalates, the risk of conflict increases, the risk of that conflict turning into a major war increases, and the risk that any major war would go nuclear also increases. So I think that possibility, that quite high possibility, that a relationship of rivalry between the US and China carries really serious risks of catastrophic conflict, is a very important part of the decisions we have to make about uh, the kind of age we want to live in and the decisions America has to make about the kind of approach it wants to take to China. What would sharing power with China look like? This is uh, obviously a very complex subject. A lot of the book is devoted towards trying to explore this. It certainly does not mean that the United States would surrender power in Asia to China. It, the United States would, on the model I'm trying to develop, remain very actively engaged 
in Asia as a key player. Its power would be there to balance China's and to limit the way in which China could use its power. But it would nonetheless require the United States to treat China as an equal, to work with China as a great power relating to another great power and with others, Asia's other great powers. This is a very different model of the way Asia would work uh, than, the, than the kind of models we've seen you know, for the last 40 years or more. Uh, it would also have to include Asia's other great powers, India and Japan in particular. And how those four powers would work together uh, is another thing I spent a fair bit of time in the book looking at. I explore an analogy with the concept of Europe in the 19th century. I don't think it's a precise analogy, but I think it does help us to understand how a number of great powers relating to one another as equals can preserve a stable and peaceful order over a protracted period of time. It's probably the best example we have of the kind of thing, the kind of approach that might work in Asia over the next few decades. Of course, for America to join that kind of order, to share power with China in that way, to be part of a concert of Asia, would require a fundamental change in the way America goes about its relations in Asia, and in a sense in the way America thinks about its role as an international player. And in some ways, it would require, I think, America to go back and re-examine the whole idea of its exceptionalism, of America as a, as a country unlike other countries. It doesn't relate to other countries as an equal. I can understand why Americans think that, but I think in the era of China's rise, uh, the United States faces in China uh, a country which is more powerful relative to the United States than any country has ever been before since America became a world power itself. And so America is going to have to relate to it differently. And it will be very important to America, as well as for the rest of us, that it finds a way to do that. But I do think that the United States, as it thinks about how to relate to China, does face some new choices to make. China is unlike any country that the United States has ever dealt with before. It's more powerful relative to the United States than any country the United States has ever had to deal with before. So it is going to have to find new ways to relate to China if it's going to relate to it peacefully and in a stable way. And of course it's vital for everyone in Asia, for China, for the United States, for everybody else in the region, and of course very much for Australia, that they should do that. The US and China can't find a way to live in peace with one another, then the Asian century is going to be uh, a very terrible thing indeed. If they can, the benefits for all of us could be very great.